Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, Friday, May 1, 2020. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. It is Friday. We made it, people. We made it. To celebrate, we are going to be joined by special guest, composer David Joseph Wesley. He is the composer of the Astronomy Cast theme song and some of my favorite music to play without lyrics, including music to smuggle by. As a fan of science and science fiction, Dave's work is often influenced by human and robotic exploration. And today, we're going to be talking about his album tribute to the Cassini mission. But before we do that, let's take a quick run through the news. Our first story comes to us from Cornell, and... Um, and that is not the correct graphic. That is the correct graphic. Our first story comes to us from Cornell and makes me, well, feel like outrageous claims. It makes me feel weird about some of the outrageous claims about how we can search for life in the universe. Um, there's a new paper in the Astrophysical Journal Letters by scientists Thea Kazakis, Tef... Zephon Lin and Lisa Kattenegger. And this paper claims that we can determine if a world orbiting a white dwarf star has life based on how that star's atmosphere looks in the dead star's light. They believe that this kind of work can be done by near future telescopes, like the extremely large telescope currently being built in Chile. Now, here on The Daily Space, we don't often take apart papers. We leave that for folks like Ethan over on Starts With a Bang, and they do a great job. But while we generally try and only cover stories with the most solid science and highlight caveats as needed, um, this is such a tangle of awesome and likely impossible that I do want to take a moment to critique things. Let's start off by considering what is a white dwarf. These compact objects are the remaindered cores of stars like our sun that have puffed off their outer atmosphere at the end of their lives, leaving behind a hot core that is no longer undergoing nuclear reactions, but is still glowing from the leftover heat of its past activity. The atmospheres of these objects are dominated by hydrogen and helium, and they are so hot that they often have either no or very few spectral lines. This means they are essentially hot little light bulbs of continuum radiation, emitting mostly a smooth rainbow of light. This is an ideal source to use for backlighting a planet's atmosphere and trying to measure the composition of that planet's atmosphere. Now, being an ideal light source isn't enough. For this research to work, you also need to actually find planets around white dwarf stars. And so far, we haven't found anything that resembles a planet as we know it orbiting a compact object. And this is where the evolution of stars make this a cool piece of research that may not have a future application. As stars age, they bloat up and eat anything in their inner solar system. They give off massive solar winds, broiling what planets are left with light and particles. Any world that is still left after this star's demise is probably going to find itself in a really bad way. But this team has modeled how healthy worlds teeming with life could be found, even predicting where a white dwarf star's habitable zone would be. Now, I'm not going to say this just isn't possible. Our universe is large, and given enough tosses of the dice, pretty much anything could happen. For instance, a world cast off its host star in a three-body interaction could get gravitationally grabbed by the white dwarf, and allowed to warm and form life under the white dwarf's UV-rich glow. Now, if you have enough atmosphere, sure, a planet could do this. Sure, we could have planets in the habitable zone of a white dwarf. 
Well, I'm not going to say anything is possible. Going faster than the speed of light is just not possible. Some things are more or less probable. And while this science is possible, it just isn't probable. But if life did somehow find a way to find itself evolving into being on a planet orbiting a white dwarf star, this planet does a really good job at describing how to find that life if the system exists. I appreciate that folks are now saying anywhere could support life. I just want more context in my press releases, I guess. There's going to be a lot of clickbait that has a lot of wrong science in the coming days. Now, in trying to figure out where life may or may not exist in the universe, we often use our own solar system as a starting point. Early on in our explorations, we started from the assumption that our sun is more or less average. Sure, there are stars that are metal poor and live in different parts of our galaxy, but we thought that when it came to metal rich stars in the disk, we were fairly normal. But no, no audience, we're not normal. Our sun is not normal. We've got all these metals, and by metals, because I'm an astronomer, I mean all the elements heavier than helium. We used to think our star is of, acti of average activity levels, blasting or not blasting our world in average ways. Now, in a new paper found in the journal Science, we're seeing that our sun is actually sedate. Research led by Timon Renhold of the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research looked at 369 sun-like stars and found that our sun's activity is remarkably calm when compared to stars of similar age, content, rotation rate, and other physical properties. These stars were observed by Kepler from 2009 to 2013, once again showing that all because the spacecraft isn't still functioning doesn't mean it's not still producing new science. Now, that data from 2009 to 2013, that was lo a long enough baseline and enough stars that we'd have expected to catch stars in a wide range of activity cycles, assuming that they, like our sun, vary in activity over time. Now, with our sun, the irradiation, the light coming off of it, varies by about 0.07% across its active and inactive phases. That's the top star in this graph. Um, other stars they found typically varied by more like 0.3%, which still isn't a lot, but it's five times more activity than what we see. It's unclear if this is a fundamental difference with our sun or if the 9,000 years of solar understanding we can glean through the geologic record is representative only of a 9,000-year calm that precedes a future storm. It could be that in the future things go entirely sideways as our sun decides to throw temper tantrums in its old age. This not knowing is a bit disconcerting. It's, it's not like I'll be around for future flare-ups, but I still like to think our sun is just calm. But the universe doesn't actually care what I think. And for now, I'm just going to hope future research allows us to understand why our sun appears so calm, and if this is only a temporary matter. So that's our news for today. Now, that isn't all we have for today. In just a moment, we're going to be joined by composer David Joseph Wesley, who has written music for Hollywood and music for science, including tributes to Cassini and the 2017 solar eclipse. Stay where you are. We will be right back. Um, as a note, it might take us a little bit longer to set up the normal, um, I still see much chaos of movement going on in the background while our ever amazing Ubermod Keeper of Maps is helping David get set up. Um, I'm going to put dog cam up. You're going to have dog cam. And I will be back in just a moment with guest David Joseph Wesley. Hello. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our next segment here on The Daily Space. I am now joined by composer David Joseph Wesley, who's one of our favorite people around here. Hello, David. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? We're, we're doing wonderful. Now, you are coming to us from California, where you can look out on the Hollywood studios, because by day, you're kind of like a Hollywood composer, which is kind of awesome. Yeah, that's, that is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we're right uh, in the middle of everything. We're in the Hollywood Hills, looking out over Los Angeles, um, which actually, with our uh, current situation, with everything that's been going on and having to be home, um, it has made it so that there is zero chance of claustrophobia at our house because the whole front of the house is, you know, floor to ceiling windows looking out over city and mountains and sky. So you see that the world still exists, um, which is, is fantastic. And I, I wish that everybody in the world had the option to have something like that so that they can avoid the claustrophobia and cabin fever. So I hope everybody's doing awesome out there and taking care of themselves. Well, looking out at the sky always helps all of us get a little bit out of our claustrophobic zone. Oh, definitely. And that's the good thing is that's always an option for pretty much everybody on the planet. The sky is always up. It's it's true. And I know I at least right now have sunshine, although tonight it's threatening clouds. But the music that you do is... You, yeah, you do You do lots of the movie trailers, commercials, all that sort of regular everyday stuff that pays the bills. But you're one of those people who uses your spare time, like so many people out in our audience, to dig into science and science fiction. And I know those are two of your passions. And if the camera pointed lower, people would see all the little Star Wars memorabilia and everything else you have there in your studio. Walk around a little bit at some point because the camera angle is going to move. So there, there'll be cameos by Luke and Leia and Han. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're inspired by space as much as you are by the big old school Hollywood studios. How exactly did you get passionate about space? Oh my gosh. I mean, I, it's, I don't know. It's one of those things where like the actual inception is one of those, those blurred experiences yeah. because it was very, very, very young. And I don't know if my parents said, look, space is awesome. Check it out. Or if I was like, that's cool. And then they thought it was cool too, but it was a shared love. And I spent a lot of time either out stargazing. I had like a, my dad bought me at one point. I was pretty young maybe six or seven, I got a, God, was it a Mead? I'm pretty sure it was a Mead uh, reflector. One of the ones that was the, the tube was actually the, the kind of hard yeah. cardboard, you know, um, reflector when the, with a little eyepiece at the back end and just a, uh, 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 what, you know, you just had focus on the eyepiece pretty much. Um, but it was awesome for lunar observing. And I lived in a cul-de-sac, a little cul-de-sac when I was really little, and we would go out there at night and set it up and look at the moon. And I would just on long road trips and always be looking out the window at stars. Um, I took classes at our local planetarium. I grew up in Peoria, Illinois, and uh, there was a great planetarium there called Lakeview Planetarium. Um, and I would go to the shows. We didn't live too far from there and I would actually go to the shows, but I would also, uh, I think it was a summer class I would take. It was either summers or on Saturdays. I can't remember which, but we would go in um, it had nothing to do with my school. I think it was just put on by the, the museum. But you could go in and basically get control of the projector. And they would teach you how the projector works. And, you know, you could say, well, let's go to March 22nd of 1895. You know, look at the night sky from Greece. Right. You know, and, and do cool stuff like that. And, you know, this is early 80s, early mid 80s. So I was doing that. Um, I remember watching lots of Nova and space programs. And I, I remember specifically recording off of TV the Nova, I think it was a two part series, one or two part series about Halley's Comet in 85 uh -huh. or six, and just wearing out the VHS, VHS on that to the point where the tracking lines were just all through it. And I can still picture it. I've been looking online for it. I can't find it anywhere. I'd love to have it. Um, if anybody out there in chat world knows where to find that old of an archived Nova, I know there's some on Amazon Prime, but I don't know if it goes that far back. Um, I would love that. And, um, 
I remember going out to look for Haley's comet. I can't remember who went in the fall, like on the approach end and the uh, when it was leaving. So that would have been, I think, um, the interstellar system, the eighty-five, and then maybe eighty-five, eighty-six. Well, yeah, it was, was fall of eighty-five. I was a little kid. I know I was a little kid. That much I know. Yeah, and, and I remember going out because it was. It must have been the the January February uh, part when it was leaving. It was um, so cool. I think it was around the December because we went out and it was freezing cold and went out to like these uh, prairie areas and there were people with their scopes set up looking for the comet and um, I just have so many strong specific memories and music was just a part of it. Like one of my absolute favorite songs on the planet. And for me, it has to do with astronomy, but it may not have that connection with anybody else, <laughs> is These Dreams by I, uh, Heart. It's like their number one song. Um, yeah. That, uh, just the synthesizers and everything in that, it's such a, a spacey feel. And I just remember being super exhausted because I think my, my dad woke me up at, you know, like 1.15, like, hey, let's go out and find a comet. And, you know, we had planned on it. It wasn't like, get up, you know, let's go. It was like, it was the plan. And it was freezing cold. And I just remember the heater was on in the car, I think, and falling asleep in the back seat as we drove out to look for the comet. And that song was on the radio. So for me, you know, in, in my head, I'm just like, my imagination is whirling about space and comets and, you know, astronomy and, and everything. So there was always a combination. And I loved the music that I heard in planetariums, the music I heard on Nova, um, you know, and the classics like Holst's The Planets, even though that's mostly mythologically based, it's still, um, you know, the planets yeah. um, and Star Wars and, uh, you know, anything John Williams, you know, Close Encounters, E.T., um, Flight of the Navigator. That movie still is one of my all-time favorites. I wanted to be that little boy. Um, oh, yeah. Hey, that was an amazing I, little a, movie. You know, yeah, I love that movie. I always, I basically kind of was that little boy a few weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> I, I got Max, the robot. Oh, really? It, right before the shutdown, I got to meet Paul Rubens. And he, Pee Wee Herman is the voice of Max. <laughs> And I didn't say it. I was going to say like, ah, oh, I look like a navigator. I didn't get a chance. Ne next time, but I will meet him again. Um, so yeah, I was like freaking out. And my name's David, you know. And the, lead, the little boy in the movie, his name was David, the character. And I was like, oh my, God, Max, the robot from Foot of the Navigator. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's a that's kind of how it got started. I, that's why I said it's like a blending, a mixing of so many different things. Um, there was no like, you know singularity that that caused it to to happen um it was just organic it was just baked in from the beginning in a way right definitely and like i basically i don't remember a time when i wasn't into astronomy and music uh for sure i mean i was into music so young um i was just telling my wife yesterday we've been watching uh during all this uh being at home stuff which doesn't bother us honestly we're we like being at home. Right. Um, we miss and we miss Disneyland and Universal Studios badly because we're kind of addicted to theme parks. Yeah. But um, we, uh, especially Disney, um, we are having a good time and working on lots of fun things, and been, we've been doing very well um, in our current situation. And I'm, I really wish that upon everybody out there. Um, but. We've been watching a lot of, uh, especially me, I've been watching a lot of concert videos. I've been watching a lot of Genesis concerts from the 80s. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, and we watched the other night, just because we had never seen it. And I was like, well, this was a huge production. I wanted to check it out. But that um, that Michael Jackson documentary they made on uh, the musical one, the one not about his personal life, um, okay. called This Is It, about that tour he um, it's on Showtime right now, and okay. just the musicianship and the band and the songwriting, just incredible. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a reason. hits. Uh, but we were watching that, and, you know, I was telling my wife, I'm like, I, I'm addicted to music. I cannot stop listening. I'm listening. When, when I'm taking a break from writing, you know, I'm here in my studio, and I take a break from writing, to just take a look at my email or something, I immediately put on the radio. I put on the 80s channel on Sirius XM or, or you know, a soundtrack or something. Like I just, it's always going on in my life. I'm just, I love it. 
And and this is this means you And I can't remember not having that feeling. <laughs> this this means you found entirely the right career. And one of the things that we're lucky about is in addition to being living in music, you also love science and astronomy and that's how we met is is you were like yes. so many people out there watching in the audience of astronomy cast and you just reached out to us one day and thus a collaboration was born and one of the things that you worked on with my astronomy cast co-host fraser kane was a video to go with your cassini cd which uh for those of you who have spotify it is available on spotify and for those of you who like to actually support the artist as much as possible um David Joseph Wesley is totally findable on Bandcamp. And I think you mentioned something about there being a special deal on Bandcamp right now. Yeah. So it's a special deal for the artists. Um, not, you know, it's, it's a special deal for the artists, but it's a special deal for the listener if they want to help the artists. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so right now Bandcamp uh, so is Bandcamp, forgoing their fees, I believe. Yes. So they're already one of the best places if you're an artist artists out there, they're one of the best places to shop your music because unlike, uh, you have a lot of flexibility that you don't have with some place like iTunes or Google or um, you know Amazon, where I have to go through a distributor to put my stuff on iTunes and everything. And I'm happy to do that. I, 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 my stuff is available everywhere. But on Bandcamp, I just make sure I have the album art and then you know I put the tracks up there myself. And if there's a problem where I'm like, oh, I wanted to change the track order or there's a typo or whatever, you can edit it. If you give something to iTunes, it's basically like, you know, printing it in bronze, like you can't touch it again. <laughs> so <laughs> at least, well, you know what? I've seen some errors pop up with like really major artists and they change them for them, but well, you know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the Bandcamp deal today is um, they are foregoing all of their fees for the artist, meaning uh, they take 12% of every sale for the artist, which actually is very fair yes. as far as the goes because iTunes, Google, and all those places, they take 30 percent um so bandcamp today is dropping all of that so if you go and buy any artist you like if you buy their music on bandcamp today the artist will get uh 100 of the sales and they've been doing that they did it a few weeks ago and they're going to be doing it once a month while this uh the, the current crisis we have going on is happening to try to give a little extra help to artists and so if if you just search my name in uh in uh bandcamp or any other artist you like it's a really easy site to use, and I like it a lot. And and your URL is conveniently davidjosephwesley.bandcamp.com. Now, one one of the things that, that worked well. <laughs> it did it did. So so one of the things that I've pulled up, and um, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this. I'm going to play just the opening. This is uh, your Cassini CD, and. You have um, amazing. Do you have a specific track that you'd like me to play a, a moment from? Oh my gosh! Um, why don't you pick one of your favorites? I I uh, I like. Um, it depends if do you want something peppy or something a little bit more ethereal and spacey. Um, I think I'm going to start with Seven Years to Saturn just because it's it's yeah. it's kind of awesome. So I'm going to play. One of my I'm going to play a bit from Seven Years to Saturn. Okay. I'm going to try and play it in a moment. For some reason, the audio didn't go through, as seems to always happen. Let's try this again. And um, let me check my... Settings. Audio and streaming are, are a big tech thing that needs to be ironed out. Yeah, yeah. We're quite working. Okay, let's try this again.
So I just played the the opening bit, which is just this. It it always reminds me for some reason of Star Trek, the motion picture. Mm. It it just brings this idea of like Voyager escaping, and the Cassini mission is built on the same hardware as Voyager. It just had a less distant escape. Now, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Now, what I, I love about this full album is you pulled in audio from the launch. You pulled in audio from the spacecraft during its final demise. What all did you go through to find all of these things that you sampled to include in your creation? And what was... What was the process of, oh, wait, I'm going to see if I can find this thing on the Internet somewhere? Well, it was actually a lot of fun. That's why one of the reasons I like doing projects like this is I already like to sit and read and learn about astronomy as much as possible. And this gives me a goal or a mission while I'm doing it, which almost makes me feel like, you know, helps me live out my my fantasy of sitting at a terminal at JPL and like, you know, research <laughs> stuff. So, yeah, I'm, I don't know how many people that's a fantasy for, but it is for me. Um, I'm right in their neighborhood too. I'm not too far away. It's um, true. but, uh, so what I did is I tried to look at mission milestones in a somewhat chronological manner. So that's why it starts with the launch and then, and that's actually, it starts with the mission planning. So I kind of start the timeline back in like 1983 when the mission got, didn't, isn't that when it got approved? Didn't Reagan yes. approve it? Reagan's NASA. Okay. So I go from there to people dreaming, planning and, um, oh, actually, I go before that. The first track is is um, is actually about yeah about Giovanni Cassini himself, and that one I threw in some elements that are very uh, medieval into Renaissance, his timeline, um, and uh, kind of threw in some stuff that was almost like the liturgical sort of sacred music at the time because he worked for the church. Right. Um, so a little bit of the Gregorian thing, and then I made it. Uh, I made the time signature somewhat complex because he was a mathematician, um, played with the numbers. And then, um, uh, yeah, just kind of made it about the, you know, the excitement of his discoveries. And then the next one is the launch. And I grabbed the launch audio, which I think I separated that from the YouTube video. Okay. Of the launch. That's I think the old I, fashioned way to do it. Yeah. I think I isolated that. Um, and I just timed it right with the music so that you get the countdown and then the launch and I well up with the music. Um, and uh, that whole piece is about mostly the planning and ends with the launch. So it's about the planning, the construction, um, basically 83 to 97. And then the launch and then seven years to Saturn picks up immediately after that, where it's escaping earth's gravity. That's that drifty sound you hear at the beginning. The dun, dun, dun. Yeah. It's like, the gravity going away, the, the the pull of the gravity of the earth going away. And then there's several points on the timeline where um, you'll hear whooshes and, and low sounds and things build up and kind of do a Doppler where it's almost like a train going by like, the, yeah. and those gravitational slingshots. So what I did with that piece is I was originally going to say, let me take each day that Cassini, you know, the number of days it took Cassini uh, earth days, to get to Saturn and turn those into seconds. Uh -huh. That was going to be a 40 minute piece. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> so I, was, I would be, but how many other people, like two other people. Are, <laughs> this is cool. Like I, so I took, instead of doing that, I compressed seven years into seven minutes. Okay. Um, and that worked. So the gravitational slingshots happen and there's the um, two Venus and one earth. So there's two times it swings around Venus. And I can't remember if it's Venus, Earth, Venus, or Venus, Venus, Earth for those gravitational number. shots. Um, and each one sounds a little bit different. And then there's a, when it flies through the asteroid belt and goes past the, does the flyby of the Masurgsky, whatever number it is, asteroid. I have like a little tiny, like, <laughs> like little sound for that flyby. Like, and then I big one for Jupiter for that slingshot. Um, and then it picks up with a beat and gets exciting as you're closing in on the Saturn system. And the first audio I used is actually on that track, and it's the first uh, radio signal that Cassini picked up when it entered the Saturn system. So that's the first bit of mission audio you'll hear is in that Seven Years to Saturn track. Um, and then Storms on Saturn, I found the recording, recording, yeah. the audio 
representation from the probe of the lightning strikes uh -huh. on Saturn. And I took those and put those into the track and buried them a bit and added a bunch of reverb to them. So it sounds like you're like you could be swirling around in the massive storm, you know, in some sort of spacecraft. And you're just hearing this massive crack and pop around you um, with headphones. You'll hear it. It's it surrounds you. Yeah, um, it, this is one of those times, folks, where if you have 5.1, you want to use your 5.1. And if you have really good over the ear headphones, use your really good over the ear headphones. Yeah, I put a lot of details in there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I also used what else did I use? I used a bunch of the radio signals because there's a lot of stuff, a lot of the radio signals picking up the. Um, I think it was the stuff where it was picking up the magnetic field from Enceladus yeah, uh, and some other places like that. And it already sounded like a theremin. Like it sounded like you were listening to uh, or watching Forbidden Planet, you know, or The Day the Earth Stood Still from the 50s, the originals. And I didn't do anything to those. I didn't alter that audio at all. Actually, none of the audio, the only audio I, I did anything to was the lightning strikes I had a little reverb to. Everything else is just straight off the mission audio from the probe. Um, and it just mixed well with the music I was doing. It just it, really it worked. It really did. It, folks, you need to listen to this. You can't, I'm, I'm going to see if I can. Oh man. Um, do you remember which track that would be in? The Rings There's of one, Saturn, I you, think. If you look, uh, what was the one you just said? Rings of Saturn. That might have, I think that might have some, I know for sure the one that's kind of quirky and weird, the one that's, um, did I call it Among the Moons? Yes. If you go like 50% through that track, there's some sounds that come in about 50% through that track that are all Cassini on top of the music I did. Okay, one second. And and we'll, we'll try and play that. I'll do my best impression of what they sound like so you know you've got them. They basically go... Yeah. Okay, let me see if I can find it. Okay. Bear with me, everyone, while I skip. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. trying to fade out casually and my fader is not letting me fade in a gentle way um so you dug out all of that and and folks in the in the chat are like wow that's jiffy i dig it oh, great. um and and then someone else is like if your heart sounds like this please seek immediate medical attention <laughs> yeah that's a bad ekg it it really really <laughs> would be unless you're a planet if you're galactus then it's great that that's true that might be true that would be traumatizing so i i just love the thought process process that goes into all of this and our folks are on your bandcamp page and taking a look at things and um nancy graz is asking um she she says looking at dave's amazing album artwork on bandcamp i'm curious if he creates that or does he work with a specific artist so oh that's a how do you keep the look and feel so consistent Oh, that's great. Uh, thank you, Nancy. And I'll tell my buddy, Jim, thanks for, uh, 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 thank you. <laughs> or I'll give him the compliment. Yeah. That's how that works. I was just talking to him last night. That's my buddy, Jim from high school, uh, James Volpe. Um, oh my gosh. I wish I had a link for his art, but he, he does fantastic work and we just happen to be best friends from high school. Um, he grew up in Peoria with me and, um, he and I just collaborate on this stuff and come up with the looks and, you know, like the Cassini album. Um, we bounce ideas off of each other really, really well. And he puts them together. Um, the only one on there that he didn't do is the music to smuggle by Firefly album. Um, 
because that's actual artwork from the video game. Right. So everything else he he has put together for me. And we just collaborate and come up with the ideas and brainstorm and spend hours on the phone mostly having fun. Uh, almost, well, entirely <laughs> fun. But uh, and it's, uh, yeah. And this really gets at the mix of stuff you do. So so another one of the, the I've got to clean this room soundtracks that I'll play is your soundtrack to Mech Runner, which I believe is another video game. Yes. And then music to smuggle by is beloved of our entire community. And I'm going to play just the first bit of the signal. And I will see if I can figure out a more gracious way to fade out. This is a skill I need <laughs> to learn. All right. So here we go. Trying again. Oh, that was the wrong song. Wrong song. Apologies. Trying again. <laughs> the right thing to use to fade out that makes me Graceful. excited um so so that of course you're a banjo player on top of everything else um, yes and you you had a blast playing all of this from what i remember i did and it wasn't going to turn it wasn't going to be that way originally um the original budget for the video game that didn't actually get released uh, the firefly video game the, the only thing that got released was my music um the original budget was, oh, we're going to do an orchestra, and then why don't you hire a bluegrass group, like a small group of players, like a handful of uh, uh, bluegrass players to, you know, to fill in the kind of Western elements. And then it went to, well, maybe you should do the orchestra on your computer, which I can do. And um, then let's do the, the bluegrass guys. And then it went to, uh, are you, can you play any of these instruments? No, they didn't actually say that. But what happened is the budget went to nothing. And so I said, all right. I want to nail this thing. So I'm going to do everything myself. And I went over to this guitar shop called McCabe's here in LA. It's a historical place. It's um, like Neil Young shops there, you know, and like just Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Well, Young, all those guys, <laughs> um, Dylan, you know, it's like Tom Petty bought his guitars there. Just everybody. Um, fantastic. Awesome place. Um, and they have concerts in the back room, which my buddy Dan Wilson just played one who you met. Yeah. yeah well, you met Dan. He just played one back there. Um, so I went over there and I already played guitar and, and bass. I started that in sixth grade. Uh, but banjo is something I'd always been attracted to. And um, so I saw a five string banjo, which is the typical one that you see, like Steve Martin plays the five string. It's right. the one where you finger the bluegrass stuff. Uh, and I, I said, well, let me try that one. And I picked it up off the wall, immediately fell in love with it. And it was one of those weird things. The only other instrument this has happened to me with is uh, electric you know, bass guitar, right? Uh, upright bass actually as well, which I've got in, in my studio. Um, but I, I picked it up and my fingers knew what to do. It was That's crazy. Awesome. You know, I didn't sound like I was getting ready to go to Nashville and shred on the bat banjo, but it was <laughs> like, they, I was making good sounding things immediately. <laughs> so, um, I got addicted to it and, uh, you know, I looked at that and a slide guitar, a lap slide guitar and yeah. a couple other instruments. I love the slide guitar. Oh, thanks. I love that thing too. And and uh, the guy, the floor salesman that was helping me said, you know, are these for something in particular? Why are you looking at all these different instruments? And I said, well, yeah, it's for a project for a video game. Uh, I said, have you ever heard of the TV show Firefly? And he goes, oh yeah, I love that show. And I'm like, well, they're making a game. And he's like, that's fantastic. And he said, hold on one second. He left and he came back and this older gentleman, older meaning like 60, not really old. Uh -huh. He walked. And, and he said, hi, my name's, oh my God, it's either Bob or Bill. I think it's Bob. It's okay. like, hi, my name's, uh, nice to meet you. He said, um, are you liking the instruments? I'm like, these are fantastic. Thank you so much. And he's like, um, yeah, I heard that you're doing the music for the Firefly game. He's like, Joss Whedon shops here and buys his guitars here. And then I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. And he's like, and, and he's like, yeah, I love Buffy and Firefly and everything so much. And he's like, I just wanted to say hi. And then he left and then the other guy came in again and he said, so what do you think? And I'm like, well, for now I'm going to get 
this, this, and this, and I, I just can't spend a bajillion dollars. And right. he's like, oh, yeah. And he's like, um, I said, what's the price on that? And they all had price tags on them, I think. Yeah. He, told, he told me, and I looked at the price tags, and I said, that's a crazy discount. Like, <laughs> going on, I said, am I getting the Firefly special? He's like, you are 100% getting the Firefly special. <laughs> <laughs> coincidence so if you guys need inexpensive guitars go to like your local guitar center and say i love firefly and just see what happens <laughs> that's awesome and and uh tropical tom is asking did i hear a mandolin in that as well yes i bought the mandolin from uh my buddy dave who went to college with me who lives out here and he doesn't play it anymore and so i bought that from him for the project and taught myself how to play mandolin and um, again, it's like, you know, I started with a bass line of guitar and bass. Right. But taught myself how to play five string banjo, uh, tenor banjo, which is the plucked or strummed banjo. It's like in Dixieland and yeah. stuff, Irish music and uh, mandolin and the slide guitar. And just sat here at this very desk in this chair with a microphone set up and um, recorded everything right here and had an amazing time doing it. And in fact, I've had a lot of people ask, and I've been wanting to. I do want to do a sequel album at some point. And this this brings me to another question that a whole bunch of people in the chat have asked. Uh, if you could play for any science fiction, science fantasy, what would you want to be the composer for? And this could be like some sequel that you dream of having. Someone was like, he needs to do Contact 2. There's not going to be a Contact 2. But... Uh, <laughs> What what would you want to do? I mean, the immediate thing that jumps to my head because it's like my, the stuff that really got me into everything is I want to be part of the Star Wars universe. Yes. Um, now, having to pick, I can never pick because being part of the Firefly universe now, even though the game didn't come out, it's it's the music has kind of made its way into the you're brown, a brown coat. coat. Everyone knows you're a brown coat. Right, and it made its way into the brown coat culture. And what was funny about that is I was one of the early brown coats. So when I first got the game, you know, right off the bat, I flipped out. Uh, it wasn't like I was a newcomer. I'd liked, I'd liked it since it was on TV when they played them all out of order. And then I thought it was, oh, this is really great. And then I got the DVDs a year or two after, whenever, I think they came out in 2003 or 2004. And watched them over and over and over and over. And I was already a huge Buffy and Angel guy. So it wasn't a stretch. Um, to, you know, keep going with the, the, the Joss stuff, just man's a genius. Um, but being a part of that, I pinch myself every day still that I'm a part of Firefly. Like it's crazy to me. Um, uh, but Star Wars, Star Wars is where I started. And I honestly, Joss said that Firefly came from Star Wars in some ways. He's like basically put Star Wars and Westerns together, you know, and and some Star Trek, of course, too. And I, again, if there was a Star Trek series, again, I would flip out. I love Star Trek TNG. I That is one of the shows that's on permanent rotation in our house. Yeah. If we're like, uh, what do you want to watch tonight? TNG. We're just always going through it and then starting over and then going through it and then starting over. Just, it never gets old. Um, I loved Picard. I thought it was really well done. And, um, and before you go any further, you said Star Trek. And I have to say, you have a theremin. Would it be yes. possible for you to play the theremin for us? Oh, what would it take? Uh, let me think for a second here. Let's see. I can plug that in because I already have this plugged in. Who? If you can't, hmm. that's all right. We can have you back to play the theremin. We just want to hear you create music for a moment. Okay. I think that would be a cool idea, though, to have me come back on and play theremin because what I was actually going to do is hook up my new synthesizer that's sitting here in front of me uh -huh. with the theremin and have them playing together. Um, I can show you these things. Yeah. Let me unplug the charging cable so that I don't have like a Chevy Chase moment. Okay. Steady cam with Dave time. Um, <laughs> you, you talked about all the Star Wars things. Here's all the characters. Here's all yep. the things and a, a synthesizer from 1983. And this, this it's gonna be dark over here on the couch, but this synthesizer, it's on the couch. We can see it. Okay, that's the Prophet 6 made by Sequential based off of the Prophet 5 from the 70s. And that is 
The Syzygy album and Cassini were made entirely on that synthesizer with no added effects. Everything you hear on the album, except for the mission audio from NASA, came from that synthesizer. Then there's you know, some more fun people over here. He-Man and Skeletor and RoboCop <laughs> and Gizmo and Godzilla and E.T. is over there. And a tiny so, ukulele. Yeah, super tiny I got that from um, and then I'll go to Theremin Town here. Um, here is the Theremin. Is that in frame okay? Yeah, it's perfect. And it's got the Ecto-1 from <laughs> Ghostbusters. It's got the one from Ghostbusters 1 and Ghostbusters 2. And do you know what that is, who that is? Oh, you, I don't think you've watched the series yet, Pamela. Can you tell who that is on top? I, I thought that it was Rose from Star Wars, but from what you're saying, I'm guessing it's not. No, you see, he, he has a Ghostbusters outfit on. Oh, that's from Stranger Things. It's one of the kids. From yeah, Stranger it's it's Things. Mike from Stranger Things in his in his Halloween costume from Ghostbusters. That is yeah, excellent. <laughs> and then, of course, the pumpkins from Harry Potter World, which I deeply miss going to see with you. I I, I know bitter because I was supposed to go hang out with Dave in Pasadena and Hollywood Hills in March, and it didn't happen. So, so Larry the world, is asking, is okay. that a Moog theremin? I don't know if more than one person it is. uses a theremin. Yeah, it is. That's a Moog theremin. Good job. It's a Moog ether, ether wave theremin. And under here, here, um, I have a couple other Moogs if there's a Moog fan out there. Let me try to navigate with my visually disabled movement and not destroy things because there's, there's a broad sword I could knock over over here and that would be bad. So, um, so for those of you who don't know, Dave is legally blind and we are inadvertently torturing him by having nope. him be his own camera human. I'm into it. I'm <laughs> up for the challenge. So there's the little silver guy under there and then the black wood sided guy behind him. The yes. Little guys with those as well. Those are both mugs. And then the light revealed endless Star Wars characters. Yes. And it's Transformers. Glorious. <laughs> it's glorious. Maybe I'll, I'll Maybe I'll leave that on. So now I will show you the newest member of the family, which just got here exactly a week ago. Um, here's the newest member of the, the family, the new uh, synthesizer. I love so, it. So this is the Pro 3 made by Sequential, made by these the same people who made the Prophet 6. Uh, their instruments are endlessly, endlessly amazing and inspiring to me. Um, and uh, it... Um, the guy who started the company, his name is uh, Dave, and he started the company in 74. So they, he's been making synthesizers just about as long as uh, Moog. Um, and, and they've as been as long on as we've been alive, pretty much. Yeah. And he just turned 70 last week and he's, he just made this. Like, I wished him a happy birthday via email. Like he's, and he, if, if you, I know Gordon and I, before the show, we're talking about MIDI. Yeah. Uh, Gordon, he's the inventor of MIDI. So that's that, amazing. Pretty crazy with partners with other people, but he's largely the one responsible for it. Um, so I can show you a little bit. Hopefully one hand um, balancing on my chin of what this little guy sounds like. Little, little big guy. And it's got cool, <laughs> this little touch strip for doing things. Um, so, so we're currently um, looking at your computer screen actually. Oh, I'm trying to bring it down some. It's hard there, to... There, now I can see your keys. Yeah, let me see if I can do this. There we go. Got it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> escape, gonna... escape. Yeah, it's not going to work. I'm just... Uh... That's, that's all right. Why don't you stick <laughs> your, your iPad back up on its stand and then play something for reals? <laughs> Hanny is commenting that this all takes her back to the 16-bit okay. video games. Knobs and dials and blinking lights. That's oh, totally from Guido. Oh, yes. That's uh, one of the things. I mean, they all do important things, but they also look really cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a great sounding synth. It does so many things. This is like the classic, just kind of 80s bass sound. Yeah. How's the volume coming it's, through? Okay? It's good. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I don't even know. I didn't plan anything out. I'm just going to play some stuff. <laughs> Super like 80s brass. Some spacey stuff. We'll try. Uh, let's see here. Oh, you know what that is? This is kind of like. 
let's try it down here. Well, it would be this. The cars. They used uh, <laughs> the Prophet 5. So it's excellent. Similar. Excellent. So does Billy Lopper. Let me try something here real quick and then you can speak again. Uh, let's see. <laughs> let's try. Uh, uh... And then I should be able to play that back and manipulate it. I just played that in. Sorry, computer. My computer blasted music by accident. Sorry. It's a. It's a. Uh, I'm still just learning this set too. Whoops. And now we're looking at your here. ceiling. I love the chaos of creativity. Yeah, here. Now we're... It's awesome. That's that's what it's like in here all day long. But uh, let's see. Here, I'll be able to do something with this, and we can get back to... Let's try... Let's see what this does. that you and I have been talking about is once I have my garden in the ground and have more time to do art, you and I want to start collaborating over on my Star Strider channel where I'll yeah. create art while you create music and we can channel Bob Ross together, I guess. It, exactly. There'll be some happy little synthesizers over here. And, and so these are the things that we're really looking forward to. But I'm coming up on 50 minutes until we record Astronomy Cast. And oh, okay. I know you were working on getting something pulled together related to Astronomy Cast for today. I don't know if that happened. Oh, I think it did. I just got a text beforehand. Um, if you're able to open up a, a Safari window and take a look um, on my David Joseph Wesley YouTube channel, um, thanks for reminding me. I put up on YouTube the, it should be up there, the full length ver version of the astronomy S theme song, which is actually, I think like four and a half or five minutes long. Um, so not just the 30 second intro on the, on the broadcast you guys do, but the actual full length piece. Um, and if it's up there, it'll be there shortly. Um, but I put it there. It's also available on my Bandcamp page. If you want to uh, go there to listen to it or purchase it. Um, it's called, I called the theme Explorers. And so it's called Explorers theme from Astronomy Cast, if you are looking for it on the Bandcamp page. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing it on did it show up yet. So uh, let me just s scout one more minute. Um, yeah, the most recent it would be things the I'm seeing are Interstellar Safari, which is still cool. It's just. Yeah, it's some tracks. I so let me yeah. pull it from Bandcamp. Those are tracks that I put up with the. Uh, 
Yes. And it's there, there's one that's just called Explorers like intro. And I think the one, I think it's track two. You'll see the, the timestamp on it. It'll either be like 40 seconds. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Probably about the same time you guys are broadcasting. Okay, so it's not telling me how long these are. So there's Explorers theme from Astronomy Cast and Straight Explorers. I probably the second one. Number it is number two. Okay. So, so it's yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and play this. And mm -hmm. I'm gonna try it try and drop the volume on it so that um you can Sorry, I'm messing with all of my settings. Um, and I'd love you to talk about your various inspirations over the music. So I'm going to go ahead and start it playing. Okay, for the theme? Yeah. Uh, they're all over the place. It's basically a combination of every planetarium show and science fiction movie and episode of Nova. <laughs> and uh, science fiction, yeah, movie, TV show, everything just kind of rolled into one. Um, with also uh, a healthy dose of my love of 80s pop. So there's some kind of 80s pop stuff happening, especially when you get partway through it, it really goes into like a kind of a, a, a basically a mid 80s pop kind of feel, I would say. Um, and there's theremin in the beginning. Um, uh, and my Prophet 6 synthesizer, uh, my Juno 60 synthesizer, which is the one that was on the floor over by the shelves. Uh, which is from 1983, so that's from the 80s, actually, for real. Um, and I think my other Roland, which is also from 1983, I think they're both on there. I used, I don't know, five or six or seven synthesizers. It's got a lot going on. Oh, and the Moog, the main theme is on the little, the little black Moog that was behind the silver one on the bookshelf. The, I think it's layered in with some other stuff, but the main... Uh, or the do 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 do. That's that's the mode. But yeah, inspired by all that stuff. Can you guys hear me? I am not hearing anything. Oh, I'm sorry. That was me. I had muted my end. Not you're. You're good. You're good. Oh, okay. Okay. Um. So, so I just wanted to say that, um, it's been amazing having you on, Dave. Um, and I really look forward to arting and musicking and creating with you in the future, and having you back on Cosmo Quest. Now, do you have any parting words that you oh. want to share with our audience? Uh, parting words. Well. Probably stuff they already know, but uh, one, thank you. If you enjoy my music, thank you. Um, and if, you know, just if you've ever supported me in any way, also thank you. If you haven't supported me anyway, but you enjoy my music, thank you. Um, uh, and I hope that everybody is staying safe, happy and healthy. And um, also taking a lot of time to learn and explore still, because a lot of what we can do as fans of science, fans of music, fans of everything, is explore inside our own imaginations. It's like endless. Uh, there's there's no better time in history to be, right? Um, we have supercomputers in our pockets, at least according to the 1960s. Um, <laughs> we can do, you know, what you have in your pocket is a thousand times more advanced than the Apollo modules. Um, you can do so much learning and exploring and fill your life and your day with awe and wonder, I find that that's the thing that keeps me the char charge the most is just filling myself, you know, filling my day with awe, wonder, excitement, uh, creativity. Um, remember a lot of what Einstein did was just going on in his own head. Yeah. You know, not even necessarily at a chalkboard or any kind of paper where he was writing things down. It was just happening in his head. So I'm not telling you to go be Einstein right now. <laughs> that would be a that would be a lofty goal to give you as my parting words for the day. Um, but you know what I mean. Just um, 
so many fun things to explore and do right now. And, you know, maybe the things you didn't have time for because you were like, oh my God, I'm so busy. I haven't had time to read the original Carl Sagan Cosmos. Well, you can go do it now. Yeah. And then you're charged up with that knowledge when we get back to, you know, life in the future, when which is going to be awesome. And I think Paranor put it really well in our chat where he wrote, be marvelous in every moment that you can. Yes, 100%. And um, I'm a big proponent of being in, well, I'm nostalgic and I look towards the future, but I'm very much into being mindful. Um, and those things aren't exclusive. You can do all three. Uh, but being mindful and enjoying every second of every is really important. Um, trying not to let your thoughts get clouded with stress or different things, even though it's, it's definitely extra hard right now. Yeah. Uh, but you've got a sunny day there, for instance, like when you go out in the garden, you're just in the garden, you know? Um, when I'm here in the studio, I'm just with my synthesizers. I'm just in the moment or, or with my astral instruments. Um, we've got beautiful weather here in LA too. So just going outside, listening to the birds and everything, there's, there is an overwhelming amount of stuff to be grateful and excited and happy about while we try to make the planet better at the same time and the humans better. That, that all sounds awesome. I don't know. Are those wise words? <laughs> I, I think they are. I think they Thanks. are. And they're the, they're the ramblings of a mad scientist and his I, you know, we always welcome the ramblings of a mad scientist. Oh, go ahead. I said we always welcome the ramblings of a mad scientist. Sure. Okay, so I do need to round out 1. this episode. One point twenty-one gigawatt. What were you saying, Dave? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and you got to have me. I I can hear you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this episode. Okay. And to all of you out there listening, thank you for being here. This has been today's Daily Space with special guest David Joseph Wesley. Find his music at davidjosephwesley.bandcamp.com. And remember, any music that you buy today from him or any other artist on Bandcamp, 100% of the proceeds is going to the artist to help make sure that we can keep the art flowing even in these difficult times. Today's episode was written by me, Dr. Pamela Gay, and this is a production of CosmoQuest. Check out everything we do at CosmoQuest.org. We are a product of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. We're here thanks to the generous support of people like you your bits, your subs, your patronage at patreon.com, that allow us to eat. We like to eat. Thank you. But if you're struggling yourself, we want you to eat. So don't worry about supporting us. We'll get through. We always find a way. Take care of yourself and know that we just want to hang out. So come hang out over on CosmoQuest's Discord and talk science share a story, create something amazing, and maybe even just play a game of Ticket to Ride. All are welcome. Come as you are. But for now, this is all we've got. So I'm going to go ahead and ask, who should I raid today? Actually, I think I'm going to forgo the raiding because in um, about 30 minutes, we're going to start up the simulcast for astronomy cast. Um, I don't know what today's topic is. I'm a terrible person, and I'm apparently going to be cramming content into my head for the next 30 minutes. So go grab yourself a drink. Go grab yourself some food. Come back, and the science will keep flowing. But for now, um, wherever you are in the world, we all share one sky. Get outside, look up at the stars, and um, have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon. Wash your hands, stay inside, and I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> Bye-bye.